warm welcome to Mr. Kyle Gibb. Let's clap it up, 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 let's clap it up. Thank you so much. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. Wonderful. I promise. I heard some students coming in. I think it was the guys that were going to be here all day. I promise we're going to be here for 30 minutes, okay? Just 30 minutes, so bear with me. I have ruined every great thing in my life. I almost got kicked out of my first year of college because of decisions that I made. I broke the heart of the woman that truly loved me the most. I disappointed my parents countless amount of times. And so many times in my life, I felt like I let God down. And all of the pain that I've created in my life, it created this, this image and this story that I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't worthy of being and receiving love because I brought somebody else pain. That even though I created a lot of success in my life and have multiple books and have built multiple business and have traveled the world, that I wasn't deserving of the success that I created. In this image, I felt like at any given moment, somebody would want to expose me. Because like most of us, we probably put on for our friends or put on when we're at school, but we're not mindful of how our actions and our decisions and our choices can either create a life of success or can build monuments of misery for the rest of our lives. I was 16 years old, and I walked into my parents' house, and my dad was sitting right there where you are. And he was like, Kyle, sit down. And my father's a very stoic man, didn't really have many emotions. And I was like, what's going on? He said, Kyle, I just need you to sit down. So I sat down, and I said, what's going on? And he said, your friend Dietrich died. And I said, what? So I stood back up. My high school best friend, like a brother to me. We took him in in high school. He was my high school teammate playing basketball. And I asked my father in this wave of emotions that I felt, Dad, what happened? Because that's the only question that I could think to ask. He said him and four other kids were in the car driving 85 miles per hour, and everybody died in the car except the driver because none of them had seatbelts on. And I said, oh my God. But at that time, at 16, I didn't, I didn't know the emotions. I didn't know how to process emotion. We weren't big on emotional intelligence back then and mental health. We just kind of dealt with things and kept moving. But it wasn't until I walked in to his open casket funeral. And I'm walking down the aisle. And every step that I get closer and closer, this wave of emotions went through me and I started to cry puddles of tears. They went from my eyes to my cheeks and then I looked down briefly and then my shirt was filled with tears. Because as I looked at Dietrich, 6'8", 235 pounds, laying in the coffin, I didn't just see a young man that I grew up with. I didn't just see a young man that I played basketball with. I didn't just see a young man that was lifeless. I saw all of the potential that would never be realized. I said all of the dreams that he would now never be able to create. 6'8", 235 pounds, fully committed to Duke University to play basketball the following year. The first one in his family that would have ever been to college. First one in his family that would have graduated high school. First one in his family that would have made it in life. He was a straight A student. But one opportunity, one decision, took everything, stripped his life from him. And as I look at a lot of your faces in many schools that I go to, no matter what you have been through, some schools that I go to, those students deal with depression. Some students deal with the thoughts of suicide. Some students deal with things inside of themselves, similar to like me when I grew up. See, I, didn't, I had parents that did amazing things for me. Financially, I got everything that I needed, I had a car, when I was you guys' age, well, 15, 16 years old, lived in a great house, grew up, had everything that I wanted. But the one thing that was lacking was that emotional connection. See, I grew up as, in a family where when you cried, 
you, you got to just figure it out. I grew up in a family where if I had emotions or I wanted to talk about a feeling that I had for a young lady or a feeling that I had for somebody, you just got to deal with it and focus on your career. Don't focus on that right now. So it created this language and this experience inside of me where I felt like I wasn't worthy, that my feelings didn't matter, that my thoughts didn't matter. And the reality of it is, is that there's three things that I'm going to cover with you all today that with these three things, when you go to DC, if you go through school, if you go in life, you take these three things with you, and I guarantee you'll be able to navigate every experience in your life. And I want you to repeat them after me. The first one is your words. Your words. <laughs> your will. And your why. See, as I was growing up, the words that I continued to hear was that you're not good enough. The words that I continue to hear is that you're not worthy of being loved. The words that I continue to hear is the only thing that matters, Kyle, is your success. The only thing that mattered is where am I going to college. The only thing that mattered is how much money are you going to make. The only thing that mattered at that time was what are you going to do for your career. So if I wasn't focused on anything outside of that, my parents didn't give it any time or attention. And just like I saw Dietrich laying in that cold, lifeless body, it's how I see a lot of us students right now. You feel like the, 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 the dreams have been snatched from you. You feel like there's probably something that somebody wants to do in here that your parents don't support it. There's probably somebody in this room that you've tried to stand up to your teachers because something just didn't feel right in class, but they put you down. There's somebody in here probably right now that they're friends that you thought were friends, they weren't, so you probably have experienced some form of betrayal, some form of disappointment, some form of something that created a language from an experience that you weren't good enough, that you don't matter. And the purpose of this conversation today, and to start with heart, before you can be able to understand and create perspectives in life, you have to first start with your heart. And for me, I needed to understand, Kyle, why do we continue to go through situation after situation after situation? Why does it feel like I keep moving two steps forward, but then situations happen and I move three steps back, and then I end up at the same place? I needed to unpack something within my heart before I can impact somebody on a stage, before I can impact somebody at a school, before I can impact somebody in a career field. And like most of us, there's probably something that's going on with you that you probably just, you just let it go. The reason that some of y'all probably don't care is because somebody in your life told you that they didn't care or they showed you that what you care about isn't meaningful. But like most of us, like most of us, we experience so much of life that it creates a darkness in our hearts. And I want you to know that regardless of what you've been through, regardless of what somebody has said to you, regardless of what you've experienced outside in this world, you are the salt and the light of this world. And when I started to realize that I am a light even though I've made bad decisions. I am a light even though I may have created heartbreak. I am a light even though I've made mistakes. I am a light that's going to shed light for other people Something changed in my life. So those decades, those decades that I was on stages and not being myself because I created this image, those decades that I felt undeserving, those decades that I didn't know who I was, one moment changed it all. I was interning at BMW when I was in college, and I got a call that truly changed my life. For years, I never thought that anything good was going to come my way. For years, I never thought that I deserved anything great until I got that call. And that one call was when my first son was being born. I got a call from her mom. She said, Kyle, it's time. I said, yes. So we had waited nine months for this process, obviously. And I was tired of baby showering. I was tired of gender revealing. I was tired of just showing up to doctor's appointments and all of these different things. And my first son was being born. And this nine month period is similar to a lot of the nine months that you probably go through life. You want something, you work towards it, you plant you know, a seed of, 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 of motivation, 
you work towards it, you work towards it, you work towards it, and then it's time to deliver. Some of us maybe are athletes in this building. You work towards it, you work towards it, and you work towards it, and you either make the team, you either start on the team, or you get to a championship opportunity. This was my championship opportunity. So I left my job, I got straight into the car, and I'm driving, it was about an hour and a half drive. I'm driving down 85 South from Greenville, South Carolina to Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm flying down the road. I get about 30 minutes, 30 minutes from the hospital, and her mom calls me. She says, Kyle, slow down. I said, what's going on? I'm almost there. She says, Kyle, slow down. She said, literally, slow down. I said, Miss Cheney, I'm almost there. She says, no, I need you to just listen to me for a second. I said, what's going on? She said, Braxton died. I said, what? She said his neck got caught with the umbilical cord. And Bria would have to give life to a lifeless child. See, everything that I had been working on at that point. See, at this point, I was a straight A student in college. I finally got the internship that I wanted. I was a division one track athlete. Everything seemed like it was turning around in my life. And then something like this happens. And it brought me right back to those days where I didn't feel good enough. It brought me right back to those days where I felt like this was maybe my fault. It brought me right back to those days, well, maybe you don't deserve this. And like most of us in here, when you've been working on something, you've been working in school this whole year and you don't pass that test. You've been working on a sports team the whole year and y'all do lose. You've been working in a relationship and you get betrayed. You've been putting time doing things at home and your parents still don't acknowledge you or love you in the way that you desire. See, for me in my life, what I started to realize is that even though we experience life, even though life shakes us up, even though things are taken from us. When we are rooted in something more than people's opinions, when we're rooted in something more than what we have on, when we are rooted in something more than just what we want to do with our futures, we begin to build roots in the ground that are unshakable. When I ran my first marathon race, I got to a point in the race where I feel like I experienced the most pain that I had ever experienced. And any runners in here, whether you're a sports runner, I believe that we're all either running towards something or running away from something. But this first race was a half marathon, so it wasn't the 26.2, it was 13.1 miles. And at the beginning of every race, obviously, they blow a gun, and then all of the runners start running. And just like a lot of you, when it's time for school, you just got to start going. You got to start believing. It's time to work. So I'm running. I'm running. And the first three miles were easy. You know, everybody's happy. Everybody's taking pictures. We're on Instagram, all these different things. But something happened around mile four or five. I started doubting. I'm like, why am I out here? Why, you know, at this time I had run 5Ks and 10Ks and all of these other races. Why am I out here doing this? So then the doubt started to creep in. And the worry started to creep in. And all of these things started to creep in. But then when I get to mile nine, something shifted in my body from a health-wise. I looked at my right arm, looked at my left arm, and I started seeing these like white crystals on my arm because I was dehydrated. But I didn't want to stop. I kept running. I kept running. I kept running. At mile 10, though, is when I was shaken up to the core. My left leg was shot. It was cramping from here all the way down. So I had to slow down my pace. See, a lot of times in life, we're running somebody else's race. A lot of times in your, in your, in your school, you're trying to be like or do something like somebody else. And sometimes you just got to slow down a little bit because the destination, the goal is in front of you. It may just require for you to slow down a little bit. So I slowed it down. But by mile 11, 
I experienced both legs cramping. By mile 12, I got to a point in the race where I could barely move. So I was running at that point like this, slow, but kept running, because I didn't want to stop. And a lot of us are at our mile 12 in our lives. Unfortunately, two weeks ago, as a board member at a school, I had to experience another student at their mile 12. But in that experience, that student, instead of continuing to take steps forward, and instead of experiencing the pain, instead of asking for help, instead of taking times to start with heart, instead of empathizing, what that student chose to do was in their life. But what I recognize in my mile 12 is that those moments when my son, my one-year-old son that I, that I prayed for, that I prayed for after my son had passed, that I prayed for another son, I prayed for another son. After my next son came and he was delivered, I prayed for him, I prayed for him, and then I got him. And then I didn't have the resources to be able to love him in the way that he deserved, and he was laying on an air mattress with a hole in it covered by duct tape because I didn't have anything. Because I was so focused on looking good than creating good. I was so focused on who knows me rather than creating value in our community. I was so focused on people's opinions that I was unwilling to take on opportunities. So I thought of that at my mile 12. I thought about the pain that it took looking at my son and I wasn't providing for him as a father. I thought about Dietrich's body, cold and lifeless, in that casket. So at your mile 12, you have to have something called will. See, at mile 12, motivation doesn't work. Inspiration doesn't work. These speeches will be great for 20 minutes, but what are you going to do when life knocks you out in the parking lot? What are you going to do when you've been working at something and you've been working at something and it doesn't, doesn't go in the way that you want it to go? See, a lot of times we blame other people. We blame our teachers, we blame our parents, we blame other people, but you are responsible for your life, whether success or failure. You are responsible for your grade point average. You are responsible for the opportunities that you either get or don't get. It is your fault that you didn't make the team, not the coach. It is your fault that you have that grade in your class, not your teacher. It is your fault that that relationship went in the way that it did because you didn't set boundaries. You didn't honor yourself in the way that you deserve to be honored. So at your mile 12, what are you willing to do? See, at my mile 12, I thought about all of the pain that existed in my life. I also thought about all of the things that I prevailed through. See, if you believe that you're the light in despite of darkness, there's something inside of you that had to kick in. So I kept moving. I kept moving. I kept moving. I kept moving. And there was something when I crossed that finish line that went inside my body that I never experienced before. And that was despite any pain that you experience. Despite any disappointment that you experience, despite any inconvenience that you experience, your calling is more important and more powerful than your circumstance. And I need y'all to say that after me so that y'all can feel it. My calling, powerful than my circumstance. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you have or what you don't have. It doesn't matter what your parents have put you through or what they haven't put you through. See, in those decades, those decades that I thought I wasn't worthy because of what my parents did, I just didn't know how to learn how to love myself. In those decades, in those decades, I didn't know if I even wanted to be here anymore. I just had to identify my identity in myself. In those decades, in those decades, I started blaming everybody else for my problems. I started having to learn how to take accountability and be responsible for my circumstance. In those decades, in those decades that I was living somebody else's dream, I started having to pick up the pen of my own story and write it myself. See, the story about yourselves that you believe is probably going to come true. See, the story that I wasn't worthy enough existed in relationship after relationship failure. 
the story that I wasn't good enough continued to show up time and time and time again. And until you learn how to take your power back in relationships, until you learn how to empathize with your friends and other people, until you learn how to take responsibility for your actions, until you learn how to be responsible for what you desire in your life, before you start becoming something more than where you are right now, you have to start with heart. You have to be willing to go through an unpacking process to ask yourself, what can I do better? What are the areas in my life that maybe I wish they were a little bit different? What are the areas in my life that I wish, ah, I, I wish I could just be a little bit sharper in this area? If I'm an athlete, well, what areas in my life can I improve a little bit? See, you may just sit here and just say, oh, I'm tired of this speaker. I'm ready to go back to class. I'm ready to talk to my friends. But when life knocks you out, how are you going to navigate it? Are you going to be like that young man that we experience? Are you going to be in your mile 12 and not know how to show up and how to show out? Or are you going to be able to have words that honor you despite your experiences? Are you going to be able to tell yourself, I can do this, I am the light, I deserve this, despite what other people have said? Are you going to have a will that despite any pain, despite any experience, despite anything that you go through, it was made for you because nothing can stand against you? And are you understanding enough about your why and recognizing the power of your calling that was put on your, on your, your life, recognizing the power that you have, the authority that you have in your life, recognizing that you're valuable no matter who said anything to you, that you are loved, that you are seen, that you are respected, that you deserve more than you have. No matter if you had breakup after breakup, De betrayal after betrayal, disappointment after disappointment, that you matter. And no matter what you're holding inside, that somebody in this world wants to listen to your story. Somebody in this world wants to see you succeed. Somebody in this world needs who you are inside. So let me tell you something. I don't know where any of you came from, but I can see where y'all are going. What y'all are doing in this school is absolutely amazing. And when you believe, when you believe that I can, despite anything that happens at stage one, if I look at it and I work towards it and I believe in it and I step towards it and I want it enough and I'm willing enough that I can make it to the other side. Your words, your will, and your why. In order for you to be successful here in D.C. and in every stage of your life, you have to first start with heart. Thank you.